are you did you hit record okay <laughs> it's an honor for me to be able to introduce jeff this morning um i've known jeff i think for a couple of decades and <clears throat> um one, one of the interesting things um that most people probably don't know about my relationship with jeff is that both of us um loved our dads and um, which will come as no surprise um, Jeff's dad was uh, many of you <clears throat> might recognize the name Jack Kemp because he was Bob Dole's running mate he was HUD secretary um, uh, he, he was also a quarterback like Jeff um, but our dads passed away um, a day apart from one another uh, his dad passed on my dad's birthday May 2nd and my dad passed on May 3rd of 2009 and uh and it was deeply impactful, obviously, for me. But a few years later, I got to work. Be, I got to join the organization that Jeff helped start, Stronger Families, and um, and had uh, a, got to know Jeff better uh, during those times. But uh, but the thing that I can say, probably more than anything about Jeff, is uh, as we've been praying this morning, God has placed him in positions of leadership and given him a lot of opportunities, but since the day I've known him, just his humility um, and the ways that he uh, continues to, to try and put God first in his life um, has always spoken to and ministered to me, um, and, uh, and that kindness and humility has always come through. I mentioned this last week as I was sharing about him coming to speak today that um, whenever he and I have an opportunity to interact. Um, I always feel like I'm the most important person on the planet. Um, and and I, I just really value, and I've learned and, and try and emulate that as I engage with people as well. So Jeff, thank you for your humility. Thank you for your friendship. And uh, I'm Thanks, grateful that, that you have the opportunity to come and share with us today. Good, thank you guys. Hey, how about I just uh, kind of pray to surrender uh, my sharing and myself to God and uh, that you also hear what he wants you to hear. Father, um, thank you for our gathering. It's awesome. And um, thank you for our freedom in Jesus Christ and our freedom to gather in this country. Uh, I just pray right now, Lord, that uh, you would um, move anything in me that isn't of you out of the way and that you'd make clear that I'm weak and you're strong and that your message, I would receive it and pass it on uh, to my friends in Christ and that you would speak to them and that they'd listen to you, that their hearts would be attuned to you. Take away things that would distract us from hearing you. Uh, help us all be daughters and sons of the Father during this time and all through this day. I pray you accomplish what you want, that what I say to be um, true to your word and would only point to Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's good to be with you. Um, there's a lot going on in my heart and your hearts. There's a lot going on in your lives and my lives, and a lot of it isn't what we expected. Um, just so you know, I'm ADD and spontaneous, and this could go anywhere, but I have submitted it to God, so uh, he'll get the credit um, for where it goes. But we will talk about um, really difficult, surprising things and how God allows and uses those. He, uh, we will talk about the word love, which we read about in John 4, and the word isn't what love is. The person Jesus is what love is. Love is of God. Love is God. Love is the Father. It is the Son. It is the Spirit. Uh, it is the person of God, and therefore it's sacrifice um, and connection, and love is fully true, and truth is fully loving. Uh, that's Jesus, full of grace and truth. So we'll talk about unexpected circumstances we're facing since COVID kicked in and some 
racial things kicked in that were always existent but have been exacerbated and political things got crazy and yesterday and today are you know the heights of that um troubling situation not troubling to god but we need to calibrate so we'll talk about those things and then uh we'll talk about our identity as sons and daughters of god that's the only way we can live his way as citizens of the kingdom, ambassadors for Christ, um, the husbands or wives or sons or daughters or brothers or sisters or leaders or followers that we need to be citizens um, of heaven first and earth as well, America. Um, so that's kind of where I want to get it wrapped up is in that idea of living as sons and daughters of our father, what a perfect father he is. And how we can live like Jesus did and receive everything that we're going to think and say and do and the power to do it from the father minute to minute, moment to moment. So th that, that's where we're going, uh, Lord willing uh, to get started. Just for those who don't know me, I'm married to Stacy for 37 years and we have four married sons. God answered our prayers and they've married, um, other people that have had their hearts open to Jesus and are following him. So we're really blessed with daughters, four of them. We picked them up by acquisition since we could only birth boys. And um, we moved from Seattle after uh, 25 years to Little Rock eight years ago and um, have been working in marriage and family ministry, fatherhood and men's mission is what I'm doing these days for a long time. Um, so I want to recognize that Many of you have faced some big shocks and some big pain and some big hardship uh, and blitzes, I'll, I'll call, you know what a blitz is. It's a bad, dangerous, scary a crisis attack. It could be surprising or shocking, unexpected, but it's not just danger, it's also opportunity. And in football, sometimes the best plays come on a blitz. Um, I'll use that work, that word, synonymous with trial, tribulation, suffering, the things that Romans 5 talks about. And I want us all to recognize that people around the globe have faced much more hardship through COVID than we have. And they started off, some of them, with no homes, running water, electricity, food, freedom, outrageous religious persecution. Uh, many don't have parents, okay? so. And then COVID's hit them hard. And then COVID's hit uh, people so hard who've lost their loved one or they're on the front lines working outrageous hours under off, awful conditions uh, in hospitals and stuff and, and police and firefighters. Uh, so they've got hardship. Um, I don't compare mine to anyone else's, but at least to be real, I'd rather share my story than throw, you know, principles and, and, and strategies at you. So let me just start with what uh, has happened since March for, for Jeff and Stacy and our family um, with this COVID shift we've faced. Um, one of our sons, the one who lives in Seattle and is married to a Gig Harbor uh, girl and has a little one-year-old daughter, he's been with the Seahawks for nine years and he was one of those COVID downsizing things who loved his job did great for nine years, has a Super Bowl ring on his hand, which I don't have, even though I played and he just was in the media department. Um, he got one of those, hey, we're, we're doing some downsizing due to COVID. You've been great. Nothing about you, but uh, sorry, you don't have a job anymore. And they just had a baby and bought a house, uh, which isn't very inexpensive, ex you know, not inexpensive in Renton or anywhere in Puget Sound. So uh, he got a good opportunity to trust God. And I'm so thankful to see his journey with his wife of trusting God, tackling his blitz and completely switching fields. And in a short amount of time, three months, God gave him a new job. That's nice. More importantly is they didn't panic and they Jeff Freeze for everybody. But we're not going to panic. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> he got blitzed. <laughs> so I'll send him a text and let him know that he's.
case in case he hasn't figured it out. I'm sure he's figured it out, but he just has to reboot. Welcome back. While Jeff is still frozen, maybe Alan, you can share for a minute or two. You literally have just returned Wait. from DC. I think he uh, is going to rejoin us. Um, literally just. Uh, oh, Jeff, left. you were yeah, frozen man. for a minute, and so we lost you. Oh, there we go. Tell me where you lost me, and I'll pick it back up. Just after your son got uh, his new job, three, oh, okay, yeah. three months. So the, the gist of that is, hey, they faced a little blitz, big to them, and we saw their faith grow. We saw their marriage grow. We saw their experience with God grow. Um, and God also, you know, guided them to find a job. He's got to try a whole new field. It, 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 it may be very difficult. It may work out, but God's in it. And he sees that. Our other son in New York City, um, married with a little four-year-old, uh, they live in Manhattan and things got crazy. And he basically shipped his wife and um, son down to Alabama to her folks. He had to quarantine after being exposed. Um, he was a nomad for about a month without being around his family. And he was handling the markets for a hedge fund with outrageous stress and pressure. Um, his life didn't get very easy during COVID. But it's interesting, that son, the oldest one, uh, that we probably needed the most increased understanding of each other and time together and to say some hard things and to wake me up to some things that I needed to learn about not parenting my kids anymore and not kind of putting my grid on their life um, and making them feel judged, not appreciated and enjoyed and loved and supported like all the others. Uh, they ended up living with us for two months in our house and I had the most fun grandparenting time ever. And our relationships had some tough, straightforward stuff happen, including we got a counselor to help us as a family. And we grew a ton, all because of COVID. And they even found a new home in Nashville and got permission to work uh, remotely. And God has changed their life for the better in a million ways through a worldwide pandemic. And then March 8th, when uh, California kind of started shutting down events, I had a 500 man men's retreat I was going to speak at and about five other men's conferences and retreats scheduled in March and April and, and uh, they were all canceled in a day and so that's the only thing I do uh, and it was all done there was no more travel and no more events uh, I don't have a job or a salary or an organization so that was a bit of a blitz but it has triggered um an amazing time with my wife because I was traveling probably too much at the beginning of the year and the end of last year. Um, I prayed for more opportunity and God was giving a lot of it. And maybe I wasn't discerning on how much of it to take. We got to connect with all of our kids, both physically and a lot of it by Zoom, phone call. And I went on a journey. And the journey was I want to know God more as my father than as the God of the Bible or the God of my faith. I want to, I want to figure out what's it like to be a son. And uh, I got some great help from a guy named Ed Tandy McGlasson that played in the NFL. He's been a pastor for a long time. We're friends. And he, he wrote books about father God. Um, his ministry is blessing of the father. And he, he talked about a change in his life at age 40 when uh, he stopped trying to perform for God as a pastor, husband, dad, evangelist speaker and he was outrageously good <laughs> but he was not at peace in his marriage and family wasn't all it was meant to be um, and he said I got to give up this performance thing and I need to be refathered and uh, no human father's perfect he'd had a dad die while he was in the womb and then got a new stepdad who was a really tough military dude and so there wasn't a lot of tender relationship stuff so he didn't get a real tender relationship view of God the father so Ed helped me, and so did Dave Patty, a missionary in uh, Eastern Europe that wrote a book called Father God, Dare to Draw Near. And uh, I went on a journey, and I wrote in my journal and told God, I want to know you better as a father. Uh, I want to experience sonship, and I'd like to learn the receive principle that Jesus lived by. Um, I'll show you a quick snapshot of some of what happened. Uh, Dave Patty's book reminded me um, 
and I sense this, that all of our hearts, men and women, are needing some basic things from our Father. And if you think of your heart with four quadrants, the things that we need are, number one, to know who we are, our identity. Now, I wrote son because I use this with men, um, but it's you're a son or a daughter. You're a child of the king. Um, you're unbelievably loved. And he says he gives you the righteousness of Christ. And you can call him Abba Father. And you'll be his child forever. And you don't graduate from being his child. You just grow more and more into a dependent son or daughter. And then God gives us his unconditional love. It's never going to go away. Tim Keller says we can't do anything bad enough to lose it or good enough to get more of it. It's grace. It's his choice. And then God gives us, which we really need from our dads, but we're not going to get it fully from our dads. Um, we're, we're going to get his pleasure, his affirmation, his enjoyment, his smile. A lot of men, Christian men, know that God loves them because they've got theology, but they don't know that God likes them. They live in shame. And they stay isolated and they hide and they try to perform and they try to pretend because um, they don't know that their father actually likes them. And he doesn't have to look at the bad stuff in them. He's already forgiven it. And he sees the future version of them. Like the angel saw the future version of Gideon before he had any courage. That's when the angel Jesus showed up and said, Gideon, you're a great and valiant warrior. You're a mighty man of God. You're a man of valor. Well, he wasn't that yet, but God knew he would be that because God was making him that because God had, takes pleasure in him. And then finally, you need to hear from your, your, your dad that you have a place in this world. You have a mission. You belong. And uh, man, we have a place in heaven and we have a place here on earth as his ambassador. And he's given every one of you gifts. Well, it's good for us dads to try to give our, our kids that and our and moms to give our kids that, but it's, it's not complete. Uh, only the Heavenly Father does it perfectly. So that's kind of the journey that I've been on. And then um, another way to present it kind of is this, that when you get your identity from him, you start realizing how unconditionally loved you are. You're plugged into the vine. And then his pleasure, his approval. And then you, you live in your place, which is bearing fruit here on earth as a husband or a wife or a single person or a friend, a worker, a leader, an ambassador, a reconciler. Um, but this isn't your accomplishment. Your place isn't your accomplishment. You're the ambassador for him. It's his message. It's his love. It's his reconciliation. It's his work. It's his word, the Bible, and Jesus flowing out of us to his credit, which should make us more and more humble. And, and, and we're always smiled upon by the Father because of what Jesus did. And we're always loved because of what Jesus did but it, it anchors in our identity as sons and daughters of the King. Um, so that's the journey I've been on. And the really exciting part of it isn't just the kind of the one-time identity reception, um, receiving my identity. Um, this will help some of the guys, especially. Identity is not earned, identity is received. And I think maybe it'll help some of the women too, because women were kept down for many times and given a very little ability to define themselves. Uh, some of it uh, was really hurtful and negative to women. And then we had this pendulum swing that said, you can be so much more, so, you have so much more gifting and leadership. Um, we shifted it and started saying women must prove themselves like men. So we've got women trying to prove themselves as sexual aggressors like men, women trying to prove themselves as career performing people like men, which that's not the best part of men. Yeah, men are good at that, but that's not our identity. Um, so women trying to perform and compare themselves on Instagram to the other woman, even stay at home moms that are comparing themselves to some people's picture, perfect, crazy, varnished, version of life, uh, this is madness. The social dilemma Netflix uh, documentary shows how this weird internet virtual world is hurting us in many ways. But identity isn't earned, it's received. You live from your identity, not for it. 
Um, you've heard a lot about this maybe from Jamie. Um, what's his last name? Garrick, Jamie. Um, he's in Seattle, he's a great guy, but his identity exchange yeah. ministry Jamie helps Garnett. us exchange our self-earned identity for the God-given identity as a son or daughter. And so once you receive that, then you have to start living like Jesus, which is you are abiding in him filled with the spirit but you need to connect to the father and receive minute to minute guidance minute to minute instructions minute to minute power from him and i'm calling that the receive principle the receive principle um and i think the journey for me has looked like this i told god i want to know and experience him as a dad and his presence all the time i asked him to refather me my friend Ed asked God to refather me, started asking questions. Uh, I, I ask questions of God in my journal and I write boxes like that square right there, which is kind of an open question. God, what is it you need to teach me about receiving your love for Stacy every day? What is it you need to teach me about getting rid of my, my quest for significance? Um, what is it you need to teach me about how to not compete to, uh, get more speeches or have better honorarium. Uh, what does you want to teach me in general? Um, how do you want to teach me to pray instead of having it be just a list of things? Um, what do you want me to know that I don't even know to ask? And God is refathering me. So ask your heavenly father to refather you. And then realize that you're not going to graduate from needing your heavenly father the way we graduate from needing our earthly mom and dad we're actually going to become more and more dependent on him, which will create a better God confidence in us and maturity, but so much more humility and so much more need to connect every minute. If Jesus, who fed 5,000 plus another 6,000 or 8,000, uh, didn't go across the lake with the guys, but he went up into the hills to, to talk and connect and pray to the Father, we need that all the more. If Jesus got up real early before it was light, to connect with his father and pray. We need that all the more. Uh, we need to take walks with the father, kayaks with the father, hikes with the father, a mountain climb with the father, a, a bike ride with the father, a car ride with the father, on our knees with the father. Um, we need to receive his presence all day long. And, and Jesus said, I'm never going to do or say anything the father doesn't give me. So we are going to become more dependent on the father like Jesus was. Um, and then I started studying the father son relationship that Jesus had. And I'm going to go through a few scriptures um, to let it kind of um, flow over you this morning. And you can go on your own search for what was this father son relationship uh, that Jesus had with the father. And what, what more of that would he want for me? And how do I present myself to God so it can happen? And guess what? It's not going to fall in the earn category, the perform category, the, the sin management category, uh, the work your butt off and be super disciplined category. Uh, you know how I do it? I started having two to three minutes every morning, the first minutes where I just go sit down in a chair or maybe in a, on the floor in this closet if there's no one around and I can look outside, I'll sit in a chair. Um, or if it's busy, I'll get in this little closet and shut the door. And I just sit there with God and I say, you're my dad. I'm your kid. Father, take over. Show me how to be your son. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just here. How do you want me to think? How do you want me to feel? How do you want me to pray? What kind of day do you want? I'm going to have a quiet time pretty soon. What do you want for that to be? And, but, and giving him that time and identifies me as a son and it begins that process of dependence, okay? Um, so that, that's been a key for me, just starting the very first thing out with a couple minutes, no pressure, but sit with the father quietly and uh, get started living as a son. For you ladies, obviously the word son is daughter. And then um, my very first prayer, it's flexible, but this is what God's given to me. Um, and I'm praying various versions of this. I prayed late last night because I'm trying to help a person in an addiction and crisis and I'm getting very embroiled in it and trying to help a codependent spouse and I don't want to be codependent myself. 
And so I said last night in bed, and I say it in the morning, Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, fill me, father me, and lead me. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, fill me, father me, and lead me. And then I remind myself, I'm going to abide in you. And I'm going to receive from you. And I'm going to be changed and transformed by you. So take over, God. You own Jeff, and you're a much better owner than Jeff. You're so much more kind, generous, good, creative, loving, smart. You're a way better owner than me. So you can have the title deed of my life. I've, I've written a title deed to my life. I got the idea with a friend of mine, Steve Woodworth. Uh, we were talking about his life and the stress he was feeling. He's a man of God that serves God all over the world, but he's feeling too much business pressure. Uh, he's a CEO, thinking about the future. Do I sell my company or pass it to the employees? What will happen with my marriage? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I said, Steve, you're a man of God. You love God. You try to follow the scripture. You still feel so much pressure. Why do you think that is? We were on a chairlift when, when this happened. And he said, I think I'm still owning my life. And I'm trying to run it well for God with some of his help. I said, I think that's it. What do you think we could do? What, what, what could you do to change it? And we eventually came up with the idea that if we had an automobile or a truck that we wanted to transfer the ownership to someone else, we would take the title deed out and we'd sign the back of it and we'd hand them the title deed and the keys and we'd get out of the driver's seat. And Steve wrote a one page title deed with about 20 bullet items of every aspect of his life. Put some scripture verses in it and then signed it. And it reminds him every morning and in each decision moment that this is God's problem, God's business, God's brain, God's body, God's wife, God's family, God's assets, God's future. And I did the same thing about four months later, kind of funny that it took me a while. Um, and I have about 30 items that I put in there. My sexual thoughts, my ambitions, my quest for significance. Um, I put all that stuff in there. My reputation, my family, my future. It is so refreshing when you're in the shower and your brain starts to twirl around all the ideas of what you want to do or what could go wrong or what could go right. And then you wake up and realize, I can't execute hardly any of that. And I'm thinking without even letting God be in charge of my brain. I got to get God back in charge of my brain. And then I remind myself, I'm a son and he owns me. Okay. So here are some of the scriptures about Jesus and how he lived as a son. Um, in Matthew, um, remember when Jesus got baptized? God the Father came to him and said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. So he said, this is my son. That's his identity. He's loved unconditionally, and I take pleasure in him. So he, he was filling up those boxes. You see that? And then at the transfiguration, God said the exact same thing about Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's the anointed one. Listen to him. So he added the fourth piece, which is his place, his identity and purpose, his calling. And God gives us all those, okay? And then 2 Corinthians 5, um, verse 21 says that God made Jesus to be the punishment for sin for those of us who are sinners so that we could become the righteousness of Christ. He gives us standing with God that's awesome and perfect because of Jesus, and he gives us credit for it. That's why you could say to someone like Gideon, hey, dude, you're already a great and mighty warrior. And all of you people who are a little disappointed or maybe even very disappointed in yourself feel some shame. Uh, shame's from Satan, by the way. Guilt's from God to get us back on track. Um, shame says, you're bad. Guilt says, hey, you did bad. Just confess it both to God and to someone horizontally, which is a true confession, and you're back in connection with me. Second Corinthians says that we already have the righteousness of Christ. That is your identity. So live from that identity and that righteousness and that righteous standing, not trying to earn it. Um, and then, gosh, look, there's so many verses in here. Uh, when Jesus was a boy, he said, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? In Mark 1, he had to get up early in the morning to pray. In John 5, he said, my father's always working and I'm 
always at work for him. I look for and I carry out the Father's work. I can only do what I see the Father doing. Um, John 14, I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. The words I speak to you, I don't speak on my own. I get them from the Father. The Father who lives in me does these works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. And then he says in John 14, the word you hear is not mine, but it's from the Father who sent me. And he's always going back up into the mountains or getting up early to go connect with the Father. If Jesus needed to connect for the Father, I need it. My gosh. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane prayer. Here's my feelings and here's my hopes, God. I'd rather not die on the cross and bear the sin of the world, be separated from you. But not my will be done, your will be done. You own me. Man, I need to pray like that. And uh, Jesus says in John 7, my teaching isn't mine. It's from the one who sent me. I seek his glory. The one who sent me is true. What I have heard from him, that's what I'm going to tell you. I'm doing my father's words. My father's in me and I'm in him. Just over and over, Jesus is connecting to the father and saying, he's always at work and I'm only about his work and I'm only going to say and do what he gives me to do. And guess what? If he needed that and he enjoyed that, we need that all the more and we can enjoy that. That's the receive principle. All right. Starts with receiving your identity. And then it's moment to moment, day to day, starting off your identity as a son or daughter, living as a son or daughter, and then begging him to talk to you. And so you don't read the Bible anymore as a Christian. You read it as a daughter or a son of the father to connect with the father and hear from him. And this morning in my journal, I have a wild day. I had this, I had a radio interview this morning. I have a, a, a family intervention that I'm involved in. I'm not a counselor, I'm like the, the supportive friend. Um, I have a board meeting, I have a radio interview and I'm packing to go to Vail for a week. And then I have a men's conference that I'm hosting. I am maxed out and I needed to hear God so bad. And I've already heard God this morning. I knew when I opened the Bible, I'd receive some things from him. I even received some things in a text message from the gentleman that I'm trying to help's mom that completely answered some questions that I thought I had to do something about. And God said, you don't have to do anything, Jeff. The family understands this, they're helping. God is giving me what I need because I'm looking for it and living as a son. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop and let you guys comment on what is your aha? What are you hearing? What's the Lord saying to you this morning? You're going to hear something awesome from one another. But here's the last story to make this practical. I'm very competitive and I love my wife, but sometimes when she and I play tennis, which is our main date, we do it twice a week, sometimes three times a week. I'm wearing my hips out. But sometimes I get too wound around the axle about the way I'm playing and I get more frustrated and competitive and angry than makes it enjoyable for her. And the other day, I didn't have time to, to connect with the father and I just showed up at tennis at seven in the morning and I missed a couple of shots in our warmups and I started to feel myself getting angry and competitive. I'm not against competition, but you know what kind of competitive idiot husbands can be um, on the tennis court. And I stopped and I thought, wait a minute. I am not playing tennis like a son of God. I'm not handling my emotions like a son of God. I'm not acting like God owns me or this tennis racket or this court or that woman across the net from me. I'm acting like I own it. And then I didn't beat myself up. I just said, that was dumb, God, but thank you for reminding me. I'm your son. Help me play tennis as a son. And I used that mindset all, for, you know, for all three sets. And it was awesome. And my wife had fun. She enjoyed it because I was receiving from the father as a son. And it was a real time shift because I realized I hadn't started the day off as a son and I hadn't started playing tennis as a son. And I needed to shift to that. So tennis may not seem important, but it affected our marriage, which is important. And everything else in your life is important. Put it in God's hands. He owns you. He owns all of it. You're his daughter or his son. He will speak to you and give you what you need. The Bible will come alive. Your prayer time will come alive. You'll receive messages from friends. Sermons will be cool. You'll go to church as a son or a daughter, not as a Christian. 
So uh, what, do you, what's, what are you guys hearing? The, open up the mics and give us your short, succinct aha of what God's saying to you. We can also do Q&A, but it's really important to hear what God's saying to you. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. And uh, we'll, I'm, I have a suspicion we'll have lots of comments here. So I'll just open it up to the gallery here. Okay. Be sure to have yeah. them. <clears throat> Jeff, this yeah. is Alan. How you doing, brother? Good, man. Um, I'll share a little bit. Um, most of the guys on the call and the gals on the call, most of you guys know that I've been traveling a lot for the past five or six weeks. And uh, the day after Thanksgiving, we hopped in the car and we drove to Minneapolis and we were there with our kids and our grandkids for a month. Then Helen and I drove to, to Washington, D.C. And Helen is there right now with her sister. I flew back last night. And I'm going to be here for a few days, five or six days. But the reason I'm sharing that, I want to give you context to your question, my answer to your question. Um, in this six weeks of kind of being away from our house here in Bellevue, what I'm realizing is definition of home. And definition of home is not a place. Uh, what the Lord has showed me in these past several weeks is that home is where your loved ones are. Your, where your loved ones are and where and your love with him every day so for this next six or seven days i will be the only human being in this house for seven days or so um but i am with him all the time and and i'll be able to be on an airplane you know in a week or so and be back with helen and and we will continue on a journey across the country that we don't even know when it's going to end uh, in terms of getting back to seattle and this has a COVID uh, has a COVID story to it in that um, you, your opening comments about you know how have our lives changed since the early part of March. Um, mine, work and the things that we normally do here has not changed a lot, but it had changed for Helen a lot in terms of her ability to really do things and see things she wanted to, she wanted to do. So this is uh, this is an honoring time for me, for her to let her be with her favorite sister right now, right now for the next three, four five weeks, however long she wants to be there. And then we'll move on to our next destination. And I'll fly back to Seattle periodically when I need to, like I just did last night and I'll head out again next week. But um, that's my big aha, Jeff, is what is home? What is it? And, and, and it's all about in my learnings and he's still teaching me here it's about relationships with him, um, intentional, regular, and the particular this time now when I will be the only one here for a week or so. Um, and then we're back with my loved ones here in another week and, and continuing on that journey. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's God, what's God saying to other people um, about this receive idea and letting God own us and uh, in this new season of learning? And I, I would like to reflect on that. If Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi. So I was really focused on your discussion of identity. And mm -hmm. I was thinking through, as you were saying that, I'm actually reading a book about our true identity and really that it comes from God and that we're we are not our ego. We are not our bodies. We are not any of those things. We are interconnected with other human beings. And that is our core identity. And I was thinking about, I have another friend that I invited to join us today. And I think that he's, I think he's just busy because he, he works for the Seahawks now and he played football too. And I know him really well. And without speaking his personal story, his identity for a period of time was very wrapped up in football. And shock of, sh shock of shocks. I can't believe right? it. And so I was thinking about as you're explaining your concept of your own identity and how things have shifted, particularly the past um, several months. And here you were going on all these speaking tours and then that shut down and you've been so open and honest about how that feels and it's an opportunity to connect with your true identity it made me think yeah all of us go through periods in life where we tie our identity to a title 
Like that's the way the world sees us. And then when that title disappears, who are we anymore? And I've gone through it. My boyfriend has gone through it. Like it's, it's fascinating to me, but then the, the real crux of it is none of that was ever significant. Like none of that defines us. So I really appreciate your transparency in discussing that because you've carried this title, right? And, and yet you're saying that's not really who I am at all. And I, I so very much appreciate that because I think it affects everybody. Well, thank you. You know, um, I, one of the things I did in the journey to let God refather me and start learning to live out of my, from my identity, not for it, um, is I, I, I processed this book slowly called Father God Dare to Draw Near by Dave Patty. And he asked me to try to examine what's the lie that I have accepted and attached myself to in my life. And what is my version of an idol? What's like, what's like, what's really big that gets in the way of loving God first in my life. And then is there a particular sin, like a, a certain way I've disconnected from God um, and keep on going opposite of him that God would reveal to me. So I got some really clear answers on those things. My lie is that present Jeff isn't enough. I'm a former 11 year NFL quarterback. I have spoken to the Billy Graham crusade and all sorts of things. And um, I've gotten to do a lot of cool things, but I never feel significant enough. I always want more. My dad was running for president when he was 50. My dad won two championships in the NFL. My dad was a players union president. Um, he's a better famous speaker than me. Um, I see tons of people spiritually that have more impact on the kingdom than me. I'm always competing and comparing and want to be more, 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 more. Present Jeff isn't enough. That's my lie. My idol is future Jeff. My dad encouraged me, said, you're a stud, you're a camp, you're a leader. I believe in you. Your day's going to come. You're going to make a difference. Um, I'm so proud of you. Well, all that was nice, but a lot of it packed into performance rather than character and faith. But Derek and I have talked about this a lot. So my idol became future Jeff, future significant Jeff, future making a bigger impact Jeff. And that idol made me too stressed, too driven. I may look humble on the outside because I want to look humble on the outside, but I'm not humble on the in, uh, inside because I'm pretending to be humble on the outside because I think that's a good thing to be significant. Okay. So my lie, I'm not enough. My idol, future Jeff, the future will be better. And I want to be significant then, um, more significant. And then here's my sin. It's ingratitude. It's, basically not being content with who God is, what he's done for me and who he's made me to be and what he's given me. And that is really, really dumb because he's gone way overboard for me. I should be grateful like crazy. And gratitude makes room for God to live in you. A lack of gratitude doesn't leave room for God. I read that in Jesus Calling this morning. Grateful people have plenty of room in them for God. Ungrateful people don't. So, you might want to go on a journey to say, God, what's the lie I've been believing? What's the idol I've been chasing? And what sin is holding me back? And then ask him to refather you. And he will. He's been doing it for me. So you're right, Alyssa. Um, Alisa, it's, 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 <laughs> it all goes back to identity. You are who God's made you to be, not what you can earn on your, on your earthly quest, whether it's a Christian performance quest or a normal professional impress people quest. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's words that I really value and needed to hear. So I'm so I'm grateful for you and this fellowship and everything. Um, at the time in my life when I had the greatest financial abundance, that was the saddest times in my life when it was stripped of me. And everything was taken away. And all I had was the people around me. Those are the most joyous times of my life. So now that my life is rebuilding, I'm squarely focused on people. 
and everything else is just like on the peripherals. So Good. I'm so Good. glad that you had the time with your own children too. So that's, that's phenomenal. So happy for you and your family. I praise God. Anyone else? One more aha, and then I'm sure we'll wrap up with, um, or, or a question, but someone else share what's on their heart. God spoke to a lot of you. Hey, Jeff, I, I, will. I was hey, thinking uh, a little bit about your four points underneath um, the Father Heart of God. And one of them had to do with um, kind of place and pleasure. Yeah, there you go. Got the little, <laughs> got the little deal there. Um, talk to us a little bit more about that thing of place, because I think that's one thing that um, I think us as guys, well, I think probably just as human beings, um, we, we see our, our, our sense of place uh, within our own identity, um, but it's not talked about a lot. Um, it's kind of a platform, a gridiron that we kind of work on um, in our own mind. And so kind of fill us in a little bit more, if you would, on that one. Okay, um, so the place where you have a place is the eternal kingdom of the loving heavenly father who has made you a soul who has a body for a while, as C.S. Lewis would say. You're not a body that has a soul, you're a your soul right. that has a body. So your okay. place, now that you have had your heart and eyes um, open to Jesus, uh, by his grace, and you've been adopted into his family, your place is in his home forever and ever, eternal. And this little thing right now, like Francis Chan shows in that video uh, that you can find on YouTube with the 100 foot white rope and the little three inch red end saying, we live for the three inches on one end, like it's the whole thing when the rope is infinite. Right. Okay. So your place is in the eternal kingdom of heaven. It's not going to be boring. It's going to be paradise. It'll be more creative and wonderful and beautiful and dynamic, uh, uh, entrepreneurial and glorious, but the glory will all go to him, none to us, which will feel good. Um, it's going to be way better than we can imagine. And the kingdom is also now in our hearts and in our loving relationships, though it isn't fully manifest, right? Because the enemy still has some influence here on earth and Jesus hasn't returned to restore it all. So your place is in this eternal family in the kingdom of heaven. You're already got all the status you need and standing to be in heaven. But then your your place on earth, and I, I you won't believe this, but I actually drew a weird picture of this. I'll try and find it. Uh, your place on earth is as his ambassador for Jesus, which is reconciliation to the Father and horizontal reconciliation, which he always did. And you're touching this world in places for him that other people aren't touching. Okay. I got to find a little picture before we wrap this up. Here it is. Here it is. Come on. Um, here it is. Okay. You can tell I'm not an artist. So the big G O D is God. Everything is based in him. The very center of your identity is your sonship or daughtership and that eternal kingdom. The next level is kind of his love unconditionally wrapped around you forever. And then he has pleasure in you and he smiles on you. Man, he likes us, women, he likes us. Uh, he gives you credit for the righteousness of Jesus and he loves your individual personality. Um, and it's gonna be perfected in heaven with none of its quirks, but he don't want to change. He made you unique. So he takes pleasure in you. He said that to Jesus twice and, and he gives us the same sort of pleasure. And then your place is where all of that ends up touching the world. Do you touch the world as a janitor, as a, a son of your dementia mom? Like my mom is getting the first stages of dementia and she broke her hip and life is all of a sudden speeding downhill. Um, do you touch the world as a school teacher, as a worker, as a student, as a retiree, uh, as a volunteer, as a church member, as a CEO, as a marketing leader? Do you touch the world on Facebook? Do you touch it on LinkedIn or Instagram? Um, are you making TikToks? If you, if you are, are you touching the world for God based in identity, love, pleasure, and the reconciling mission he's been giving you, uh, read 
Jack, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. Soak in it. And you'll see, we don't see any human being from the same perspective anymore. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And then it goes into saying, your job title, ambassador for Christ. Your mission, reconciliation. Your message, reconciliation. Mm. Your standing with God and your credit that God gives you, righteous because of Jesus. You live from it. And then you just take that and apply it to wherever you are. That's your place. And I do think that your strengths are kind of what God wants to see polished and stewarded when you give it over to his ownership. Uh, because a lot of identity stuff, if I talk in a secular audience, I'm going to talk to them about um, identity is based in relationships and strength. If you know your real strength, I'm an imparter of vision. That's who I am. I'm not an entertainer. I'm, I'm not a speaker. I, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an ex-football player. Yes, I'm a son of God and a, a husband to Stacy and a dad to these cool kids and a grandpa now. Um, but hey, I, I'm an imparter of vision. That's where you put me on your team. So that's place, Jack, okay? Send me an email. It's jeff at jeffkempteam.com or call me 425 I'll do it again, jeff at jeffkempteam.com or call me 425-442-1110. And I'll, I'll send you some of the things God's been planting with me on identity and purpose and mission and how it all fits together, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I really you might kind of mentioned any of that. And I think there's kind of this element that we all make these shifts, right? I mean, just like football plays or like half times, and you've got to you've got to reshift. And all of a sudden, your place is different, and yeah. and I think there there's seasonal elements to it, and there's there's ways in which we influence that's kind of radically different, um, and we have to live into that and own that, um, yeah. which um, which yeah, it'd be great. We'll we'll talk offline on that. Yeah, that'd be okay. great. We appreciate. It. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Yeah. Can I, Dan, can I wrap up? Dan, Derek, let, 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 let Mitch have his comment. I, I want to hear Mitch, if we don't mind. Eric, I appreciate that. Jeff, you've the content of your speaking this morning. There are so many boxes I'd like to pull from and make comments about. But I think I principally want to address what we all endured yesterday. And having you speak of recovery from narcissism, recovery from being self-centered and, and the addiction of, of charisma and from being a leader to now being a member. And I'm grateful to uh, today and the um, being so rattled yesterday to have you speak on what it means to clearly you, you've had a very high profile life, but I'm grateful to hear in your own journey that you're now interested in membership more than being a leader and, and an example to have being a member be how you walk God's life yeah. is within you. But Mitch, more, I think you're, you're getting us to the point, Mitch, that um, if we know that we're all created in the image of God, we're all cherished and special and loved. But if we see ourselves through God's eyes, which is humility, then we're going to know that we're outrageously loved, but incredibly flawed. And we were meant to live in community as part of we. And the body of Christ, Ephesians 2.10, is a masterpiece, a poema. That's a plural word, not an individual word. And a leader is not a dictator or an inspiring hero. They are a servant. And so that word member, uh, you've got a lot to offer by helping us think about that. But many of us are leaders, but our, our job as leaders is to lower ourselves and surprise those who don't feel like they have significance and pass on power to empower others and to serve in the same way Jesus did. And addiction to narcissism and self, uh, yeah, the president and yes, the culture. <laughs> and look at look for it in myself um, and look for it in the left and look for it in the right and in Christians and non-Christians. Uh, so boy, God shine the light help us see truth, rest in humility, and bring some shalom. Amen. Yeah. Well, let me go ahead and wrap this up. Um, 
Um, Jeff, thank you. Um, really can't thank you enough. All, all four of the pieces of that quadrant, I stand my hand, raise my hand and say, yep, that's me. Hey, Dan, and, before you close, can I have yeah. 30 seconds on a key sure. issue? Sure. Right. There is incredible satanic spiritual warfare going on that is behind so much of the yucky political and racial um, and kind of moral values stuff that's breaking the generations apart. And you feel the division in your families, uh, people that couldn't uh, talk with their kids and their kids can't talk with them. They're anti each other on Facebook, et cetera. I've seen families split up, churches split up, small groups split up. Uh, please, please remember it's spiritual warfare. Okay, number one. Number two, we are putting our ideology ahead of the heart of God for family, the way that uh, our friend Alan was talking about. And any parent that's wise knows that your job is to parent the heart of your child, not all the beliefs and positions and who they vote for and what their view is on how bad we've been to homosexuals and how we need to change the law. Um, no, parent their heart. That's gonna come from humility, self-reflection, telling them what you're learning about yourself that's flawed. And then the best parenting we can do to any adult child is to apologize and be humble and get out of the coaching, parenting, moralizing uh, place. And so it's not us or them, it's we. We don't need to win the political battle and lose the souls and the spiritual war. So realize there's division going on. You can be the peacemaker in your family. You can tone it back. You can say what you're learning about yourself, where you think you're off track, what you want to apologize for, and say nothing about what you think they're doing wrong or where they're off base. I promise you, you'll get more reconciling results from that than you will a super deep Bible study and tons of emails and texts that show them what the best position is according to God. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeff. So let me officially close this in prayer. Those of you who need to leave, um, bless you and thank you for joining us. Um, those who want to stick around and keep talking, um, that's sort of our motto. We, we, we keep talking until no, one, no one's left to talk with. So uh, Jeff, thank you again for joining us this morning. Um, pleasure. Just, uh, My pleasure, totally. Well, I'm, thank go, you. I'm going to a board meeting on fatherhood here in a second. So I typically <laughs> have to stay on a long time, but I can't. <laughs> okay. Father, thank you for uh, Jeff. And Father, we thank you for his family and and uh, really his conversation this morning. Father, it's such a huge reminder um, to me personally of uh, just the idea that you look at us and you like us. Um Father, probably one of the, the most difficult things for me personally to, to, to understand and appreciate and value is that uh, you don't see me as I am. Uh, you, you don't love me for what, I, um, what I'm not. You love me because of, you, of the fact that you first loved me anyway. And I don't have to, um, I can't do anything more to get more of that love. I can't do anything so that I don't receive your love. Um, father and that my identity is in you and not my job or not my status or not my bank account or not where i live or my car father um thank you for this terrific reminder this morning father as we all go our way i pray that we would all have that understanding of we're your children you are our father and uh, we can rest and rely on that relationship of of being your son or daughter and so we thank you for that. I just pray all these things and um, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I'd love to hang around you guys, but I got to go to this Fatherhood Commission board meeting. Uh, you don't need me. God's speaking to you. Keep receiving from him. Love Great. you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for being so Jeff. One of the things that Jeff told me in a conversation a few weeks ago re with regard to COVID, this was just prior to me catching COVID actually, is to be, um, to be prayerful, be careful, but not be fearful. And um, I just love Amen. that. And uh, I think it's a good word for us for in, in general, um, as we approach this new year and uncertain times, to be prayerful, careful, but not fearful.
You know, that last word, I'm glad he said that. It was funny. That was going to be my question, but I want to let other people talk. But this thing about um, signing your life to God, your business, your own life, I've been thinking a lot about my kids as they get grown and have their own thoughts about things and heading out in the world without me, you know, whether it's driving or working and thinking their way about things and uh, um, trying to let them go. It's hard to, you know, I think I need to sign them over to God. Amen to that. I, I, I honestly, I, I um, was hesitant to come to the meeting this morning because we were up late last night talking about all the stuff that was going on in DC. And uh, I just was so blessed by this conversation. And uh, he, he is, um, he's one humble guy. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, and I appreciate his integrity and honesty and sharing, you know, his own weaknesses um, and through that whole process. And um, yeah, I, he just used a lot of words that were really beautiful and, and totally resonated for me. So I was super thankful for that. Thank you. And Banked um, and Garrett, actually both of you guys, I, I, I love and appreciate that you guys are like, Kind of active note takers and actively sharing uh, links and, and insights and ideas and stuff as we're going through the meeting. 